Hello, everybody. This is uh, Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Uh, welcome to this episode of Bible Talk with Brother Luke. Uh, tonight, I'm continuing in the study of the book of Ecclesiastes. In fact, I will conclude the study tonight. I'm going to pick up where I left off last time uh, at the beginning of chapter 12, verse 1. Now, if you have not seen the previous videos on Ecclesiastes, I hope you will go back and watch it from the beginning so you can get the whole context of this book. Uh, I'm a KJV firstist, so I will read it first in the KJV, and then probably I will also look at it in the Amplified, because the Amplified is, is like a translation and a commentary blend. Sometimes I find it to be helpful. So let's let's begin. Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 1. Remember now thy creator in the days of thy youth, while the evil days come, nor the years draw nigh, when thou shalt say, I have no pleasure in them, while the sun or the light or the moon or the stars be not darkened, nor the clouds return after the rain. In the day when the keepers of the house shall tremble, and the strong men shall uh, bow themselves, and the grinders cease because they are few, and those that look out of the windows will be darkened, and the doors shall be shut in the streets, when the sound of the grinding is low, and he shall rise up at the voice of the bird, and all the daughters of music shall be brought low. Also, when they shall be afraid of that which is nigh, and fears shall be in the way, and the almond tree shall flourish, and the grasshopper shall be a burden, and desire shall fail, because man goeth to his long home, and the mourners go about the streets. Or ever the silver cord be loosed, or the golden bough be broken, or the pitcher be broken at the fountain, or the wheel be broken at the discern. I mean the cistern. Well, that's a lot. Uh, that's one sentence. <laughs> that's pretty amazing. That's probably the longest sentence I've ever read. I mean, I thought the Apostle Paul was, he was known for going on and on in one continuous sentence. Uh, but uh, this, is, this is amazing. Well, let me give a little context um, uh, for the whole book. Uh, written by King Solomon. He also wrote uh, Song of Solomon. He wrote uh, the Book of Proverbs. Uh, he uh, was the, the son of King David. He uh, was the richest man in the world. Uh, he His fame was probably maybe greater in the world than anybody ever uh, up to that time because uh, he was known for wisdom. In fact, much of what's in this book, Ecclesiastes, is really about wisdom. And the book of Proverbs is all about uh, wisdom, you know, how to gain wisdom and, and uh, um, what you need to do so that you are wise and the benefits of wisdom. However, in Ecclesiastes, this is written uh, at, when Solomon is older and he's reflecting on his life. And he's, he's in the earlier chapters, he, he lays this groundwork that uh, all the great things that he's acquired and he's, he's learned and accomplished, it's all just what he calls vanity. Uh, or uh, the, another word for it would be futility or meaningless. Um, he concludes that really that nothing really matters except and until you know God and uh, have this relationship with God that you, you were created for. And so Solomon um, is, is, is an amazing um, um, lifeline as, as, he, as he goes through life, uh, writing Proverbs, teaching us all how to be wise and then himself becoming such a fool that he he uh, he, he marries uh, unbelievers who are uh, uh, who are uh, 
uh, will get, lead him astray into false religions. And so he he's concluding that no matter how many horses he's owned, how many wives he has, no matter how much gold he has and, and wealth and how much wisdom he has, it's all vanity. It's all meaningless. The only thing that really matters, first and foremost, is knowing God. And that's uh, that's what I try to emphasize in my ministry uh, over and over again, is that we can study the Bible from from Genesis through Revelation and and uh, we can be very knowledgeable in all theological matters, but unless and until you understand that, that salvation is a free gift from Jesus Christ and you, you receive this salvation through faith in Jesus Christ, um, everything else is vanity. Nothing really matters until you first secure this promise that you're going to go to heaven because you have put your faith in Jesus. So it's the same kind of conclusion uh, that I'm seeing in uh, from Solomon here in uh, Ecclesiastes, the conclusion that I've reached in, in my life, realizing that, uh, that uh, everything else is uh, you know, secondary, of much less importance. Uh, the, obviously, the most important thing is knowing Jesus, receiving the gift of salvation. And I've said recently that um, if you want to do some good things in your life, let's say that you you want to donate your money to charity or you want to feed the hungry and clothe the naked as Jesus told us to do and you go about to do all those things. When you feed the hungry, you, you're saving their life maybe for a day from starvation. Uh, but uh, once that's done, uh, what is what is really the most important thing? The whole point of their life is to receive eternal life. And if we have failed in that respect, and if we've been negligent and not told them the most important message in the Bible, that salvation is a free gift offered to everyone, and you receive it simply by faith in Jesus Christ, then uh, then we failed. No matter how many good things we try to do in life, it's a failure. It's vanity. It's meaningless uh, unless we first make sure that they understand salvation and receive salvation. So this is kind of the, the point of, of Ecclesiastes. Uh, from, from the beginning to end, he's talking about all these, these uh, things in his life, these great accomplishments, these great acquisitions, and, and yet he concludes it's all meaningless. Let me read these first few verses. Verses. It's one sentence, but it's six verses. Let me read it in the Amplified. See how it's phrased. Uh, the Amplified also uh, put, puts in a title for chapters and also um, um, subchapters. And the, the title for this chapter is Remember God in Your Youth. Uh, chapter 12, verse 1 in the Amplified. Remember thoughtfully also your creator in the days of your youth for you are not your own but his before the evil days come or the years draw near when you will say of physical pleasures i have no enjoyment and delight in them so uh, again just another example of, of so many points that he makes that the things that we 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 value physical pleasure uh, that we we pursuing pleasures, uh, some kind of gratification through through uh, um, eating good foods, uh, li living in a, a bigger, fancier home, having all the material comforts, uh, all the newest modern technologies. We we seek these things. We think we're going to get pleasure from them. But he says, before the evil days come or the years draw near, when you will say. Of physical pleasures I have no enjoyment and delight in them before the Sun and the light and the moon and the stars are darkened by impaired vision in other words as we grow older it's happening to me right now I know my my vision is getting worse and if we live long enough we will eventually go go blind and so he's saying that uh, Uh, 
before the sun and the light and the moon and the stars are darkened by impaired vision. So be, before you start losing your vision and the clouds of depression return after the rain of tears. Hmm. So you, uh, people grow old, they lose their eyesight, they get depressed as they get older. And uh, in, in the days when the keepers of the house, hands, arms tremble and the strong men, the feet and knees bow themselves and the grinders, the, the molar teeth cease because they are few. So I'm really glad that uh, I have this amplified because it, it gives, it's giving us all, I hope, uh, some understanding that uh, I, I never would have thought of the word grinders to be the molar teeth. Uh, so this is the value in looking at uh, translate, other translations, uh, biblical commentaries. Uh, we're, we're going to learn things that we didn't see at first glance in, as we read the KJV. So it's talking about getting old and losing your vision and your your teeth and your strength. Uh, in the day when the keepers of the house, that your hands and your arms tremble, and the strong men, your feet and your knees, bow them, bow themselves, bow themselves, I guess not bow, bow themselves. So you you get bow legged as you get. Uh, you know, your legs become weaker as you get older, and the grinders, the, your molar teeth cease because they are few, and those eyes who look through the windows grow dim. When the doors, uh, the, the, the lips are shut in the streets, and the sound of the grinding of the teeth is low, and one rises at the sound of a bird. Uh, and the crowing of a rooster, and all the daughters of music, the voice and ears sing softly. Furthermore, they are afraid of a high place and dangers on the road. The almond tree, the, the hair blossoms white. Your hair gets white as you get older, and the grasshopper, a little thing, is a burden. And this capperberry, Desire, appetite, your appetite fails. For a man goes to his eternal home, and the mourners go about the streets and marketplaces. I think that Ecclesiastes, uh, it can be very easy to um, read it, and the only thing you get out of it is depression. It's, it can be a very, very depressing book. Um, because he's really making the point that everything is just meaningless. Uh, you know, uh, everything we do in our lives, eventually it just means nothing and we'd all die. And that's what we have to look forward to. Um, but the one thing that makes life have meaning is our relationship with God. That's why we were created for a relationship with God. Let's now read it back to the KJV, verse uh, 7. Then shall the dust return to the earth as it was, and the Spirit shall return unto God who gave it. Vanity of vanity, saith the preacher, all is vanity. So this, these first eight verses here really kind of sum up this entire book of Ecclesiastes. Um, what we all have to look forward to is realizing that we acquire wealth, we acquire knowledge, we acquire wisdom, but uh, those are not treasures for heaven. We can't take anything with us. And yet our body grows old and weak. We lose our eyesight, our teeth fall out, and, and uh, eventually we... We, it says the dust returned to the earth as it was, and the spirit shall return unto God who gave it. Vanity of vanity, saith the preacher, all is vanity. All is meaningless. I'll read those in the Amplified. Verse 7, Then the dust out of which God made man's body 
will return to the earth as it was, and the spirit will return to God who gave it. Vanity of vanity, saith the preacher, all that is done without God's guidance is vanity, futility. Well, I, I, I really think that this is a, a conclusion that, that we all need to conclude. We need to realize at some point in our lives. Um, I think uh, I, I reached this point uh, in December of 1986. This was the turning point of my life. I was born in November 19th, 1950. And until December of 1986, all those years, this is really a description of my life. All the things that I did, all the, the, the uh, pursuit of pleasures, all of the educational uh, and uh, the pursuit of works, uh, working and uh, career, all these things were just meaningless because in December of 1986, that's when my mother died. That's the first time I had to face a death in my family. And it's that death that made me realize there's there's something more and I need to learn about it. You know, what, what, what happens after we die? What is the purpose of life? Uh, and I, I, I turn to the Bible for the answers. And thank you, Jesus, that the Bible is the truth, the Word of God. And, and that's, what, that's where I get the true answers. And I've been studying the Bible ever since, since December of 1986. And as I learned about our great Savior, God, Jesus, and that he loved me so much that he died for my sins and raised himself from the dead, showing that he is God and Savior and, and uh, the source of life everlasting. And he, he offers me life everlasting if I'll just put my faith in him. Uh, when I realized that, when I learned that from reading the Bible and I put my faith in Jesus, from that point on, life had meaning. Before that, life was meaningless because God created me and you with a purpose. And the purpose is not just to become educated or to become wealthy or to acquire as many things or toys in your life. Some people say that Whoever has the most toys wins. But Jesus said, build up your treasures in heaven. Moth and rust, rust cannot destroy it. Those treasures. But the treasures you're building up on earth through trying to gain material things or fame or physical pleasures, these things are treasures that just are temporary, that fade away and really are vanity or meaningless. So that's really what we should learn from this book is that life has really no value or meaning to anybody uh, until they realize that they were created with a purpose and that is a relationship with God. And, and this can only be uh, achieved or attained, or realized by faith in Jesus Christ, our great Savior God. Verse 9 in the KJV. And moreover, because the preacher was wise, he still taught the people knowledge. Yea, he gave good heed and sought out and set in order many proverbs. That's what he did. King Solomon wrote the book of Proverbs. He uh, was considered to be then and even now the wisest man in the world. And if you read the book of Proverbs, uh, you, 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 I did a complete study on that. That's available on my YouTube channel too. Uh, all 31 chapters of the book of Proverbs. And if you will go through that, uh, you, your life will be blessed. You know, you gain wisdom. Uh, so he's talking here about how the preacher sought to find out. You know, and because the preacher was wise, King Solomon, he still taught the people knowledge. 
he wrote the book of Proverbs. Yea, he gave good heed and sought out and set in order many Proverbs. So he's saying here that he wrote the book of Proverbs. Verse 10, the preacher sought to find out acceptable words and that which was written was upright, even words of truth. The words of the wise are as goads and as nails fastened by the masters of assemblies, which are given from one shepherd. And further, by these, my son, be admonished of making many books there is no end, and much study is a weariness of the flesh. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. For God shall bring every work into judgment and with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. So he's concluding that uh, uh, you could be the richest man in the world, he was, the wisest man in the world, he was. Uh, you, he, he sought to satisfaction in life and meaning life through uh, a thousand wives, uh, you know, uh, um, pursuit of every kind of pleasure and every type, type of material wealth. And, and he realized that it's all meaningless, all vanity. What he really needed and what you need and I need is fear God. That means really respect God or understand that God is your top priority. You must first and foremost get this relationship with God. And it, the Bible says this relationship with God is only available through Jesus Christ, our great Savior God. That God manifest in the flesh, the Son of God who died for our sins and rose from the dead. Let me read these verses here in the Amplified. Furthermore, because the preacher was wise, he still taught the people knowledge, and he pondered and searched out and arranged many proverbs. The preacher sought to find delightful words, even to write correctly words of truth. The words of the wise, like prodding goads, these collected sayings are fixed firmly, are firmly fixed in the mind, like well-driven nails. They are given by one shepherd. But beyond this, my son, about going further than the words given by one shepherd, be warned, the writing of many books is endless, so do not believe everything you read. An excessive study and devotion to books is wearying to the body. When all has been heard, the end of the matter is... Fear God, worship him with awe-filled reverence, knowing that he is almighty God, and keep his commandments, for this applies to every person. For God will bring every act to judgment, every hidden and secret thing, whether it be good or evil. So again, just as he did in the chapter 11, he concludes talking about we have to have something to look forward to. At the conclusion of our life is an event that no one can escape, and that's the judgment. So, um, are you ready to be judged by God? Most people think that um, if they died right now and God said, why should I let you into heaven? Most people think, well, um, I, 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 I'm a pretty good person. I mean, especially if you compare me to a lot of people I know, uh, I'm pretty darn good. But the Bible tells us that no one is good. Only God is good. Um, and, uh, but what about relative goodness? If you're not good in terms of like God is good, perfect, well, at least, aren't you relatively good? Aren't you at least one of the better people? Well, if you were one of the best people and, and you were righteous, well, the Bible says no one is righteous, not even one. Not one man is righteous. The Bible says the righteousness of man is like filthy rags in the sight of God. So if your plan is... Or, or, or hope is that 
when you die and go to the judgment and you can plead your case to God based upon how good you are, I've got bad news for you. The righteousness of man is like filthy rags in the sight of God. The Bible says we all four fall short of the glory of God. If you want to get into heaven based upon personal merit, then the standard you have to meet is perfection. That standard was set by Jesus Christ. He lived a sinless, perfect life. You have to match it if you expect to go to heaven based on your own life, your own performance. Now, if you can understand that that's impossible, as Jesus said, see, Jesus was making this point to his disciples and how strict the standard is. And his apostles said, well, if this is the case, how can anyone be saved? And Jesus said, with man, it is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. So you have to understand and conclude that um, uh, living a life that is um, acceptable to God and, and, and uh, so pleasing to God that he's going to say, oh, you get to come to heaven because you're so good. That's impossible. Give up on that. Jesus says, with man, it is impossible to reach that level. That's why it was necessary for God to come to our rescue. And the Bible tells us that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. God loved the world, all of mankind, you and me. He loves us so much that he gave his only begotten son, Jesus Christ, God manifest in the flesh as the son of God and our savior. God sent his son and why did he come down from heaven and become a man? Jesus said, I came to give my life as a ransom. A ransom is a payment made to set someone else free. And that's why Jesus came, and that's exactly what he did. He was faithful, and he willingly offered up his life. And he willingly went to the cross, suffered and died. And the Bible says that he became sin for us, and that all of our sins were charged on Jesus Christ. Your sins and mine. All the people who've ever lived, our sins were put on Jesus Christ. He paid for our sins. That's how much God loves you. And the Bible says, whoever believes in him, Jesus, will not perish. That means you will not go to hell and suffer the second death in the lake of fire where you perish. That will not be your fate if you put your faith in Jesus Christ. Instead, it says, you will have life everlasting. You're going to go to heaven. You're going to, you'll, you'll live in paradise. The new heaven is the new earth forever with joy and peace forever and ever. That's offered to you, the Bible says, as a free gift. The Bible says the wages of sin is death. Well, Jesus paid that for you. He died for you. It says, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So the gift, now a gift is something that, if someone offered me a gift, uh, that means that they bought it, they paid for it, they did everything that is required to, to give it to me, and all I have to do is accept it. I don't have to reimburse them I don't have to pay for it. I don't have to go start mowing their lawn and washing their car as a payback for the gift. Otherwise, it's not a gift. It's wages. And this is what the Bible says. For it to be a gift, that means that there's no strings attached. You just need to receive it. And how do you receive the gift of life everlasting? By faith in Jesus Christ. That means you are going to depend on him. You're counting on him. You're uh, confidence is all in him. You're no longer striving, working, thinking that if I'm just good enough, God will let me into heaven. Reject that and instead 
Put all your confidence in Jesus Christ. And if you do, the Bible says you're guaranteed you're going to go to heaven. I hope you'll do that now. And I, I hope if you haven't seen this entire study of the Ecclesiastes, please go back and, and watch it from the beginning. Uh, bless you all in the name of our great Savior God, Jesus Christ.